With smarter looks, a classier cabin, high-tech features and a more efficient engine range, the improved first-generation version of Vauxhall's Insignia has now enhanced its already impressive CV for success in the medium-range Mondeo sector. More than ever, it's a model you really can't afford to overlook. Welcome to Britain's best-selling traditional family car. Yes, you heard that right. That title belongs not to the kind of family models that make the headlines, uh, fashionable crossovers, practical people carriers or slinky SUVs, but to this one, Vauxhall's Insignia. There must be something very right about this car. I tend to call the segment it competes in the medium range Mondeo sector. But the truth is that for years now, the Insignia has been not only massively outselling its Ford rival, but also bucking a developing trend amongst buyers keen to abandon their traditional family saloons and hatches for either premium brands or the latest trendy crossover or SUV. Launched in 2008 as a more stylish replacement for the uninspiring Vectra, this model was instantly well received, carrying off the coveted 2009 Car of the Year title and racking up impressive sales, at the same time as other mainstream brands like Renault and Citroen were struggling desperately in this sector. Beyond the stylish panel work though, there were a number of issues that began to hold it back as the years rolled on. An interior over cluttered with complicated little buttons, a suspension setup too focused on the firm side, an absence of the kind of high-tech features becoming commonplace on many rivals. And then there was a pricing policy that pitched the list figures up quite high but left lots of room for dealer discounting. That meant your insignia was often cheap to buy, but if, like most, you owned one as a company car, it was often pricey to tax, given that P11D tax is based on the list price of the car, not what you actually pay for it. All of that needed sorting, and sure enough, has been corrected in the smarter looking and much improved model that we're going to look at here, launched in the late summer of 2013. There's a more inviting and up-to-date cabin, a more compliant suspension setup, and a complete roster of gadgetry. Plus pricing that's more affordable and therefore closer to what you'll end up paying and being taxed upon. All the boxes then seem to have been ticked. Let's check this car out. If medium range model buyers all prioritised pin sharp handling and razor sharp response, they'd all buy Ford Mondeos, but they don't. And they shouldn't. Cars like this one don't spend their lives on open highland country roads, but on endless motorway trips and snarled up suburban crawls. Dynamically, they should be designed to suit that remit, which the Insignia always was, though with an, a suspension setup that many felt was rather on the over firm side and levels of refinement that weren't good enough with the diesel engines that most buyers chose. Both those issues have been addressed here. First up, this improved model has had a thorough chassis update, tested on proper bumpy British roads, with a redesigned rear suspension system to improve ride comfort, and a steering calibration refreshment that's brought a more direct feel through the corners. And both of those issues can be further improved if you tick the extra cost box for the FlexRide adaptive damping system that networks ride and response via three driving modes. Tour softens the suspension for long distance comfort, while Sport sharpens the steering and throttle response at the same time as stiffening the springs for a firmer, more dynamic experience. Finally, there's Standard, which aims to strike a reasonable everyday compromise between the two. Now, you can't fault the effort that's gone into all of this. Over 60% of the chassis componentry is new, but it's not enough to make this into a car you'd really describe as rewarding. What it does do is to perfect what was there in the first place. This insignia really is now dynamically fit for family and business purposes, with no caveats. True, a Mazda 6 or a Mondeo might handle the twisties with a little more elan, but for most of the people, most of the time, this dynamically is all the car they will ever need, quietly and effectively getting on with the job of getting you from A to B. 
The quietly bit is important. Almost all insignia buyers want a diesel, and though the original version of Vauxhall's 2-litre CDTI unit had many merits, refinement wasn't one of them. In fact, it was one of the noisiest, rattliest diesels in its class, but it isn't now. True, there are still quieter black pump buys in this class, but at least this car will no longer wake the neighbours when you fire up on a cold morning, or tire you in traffic with its constant rumbling thrum. It comes in three main EcoFlex guises these days, offering you a choice of either 120, 140 or 163 PS. And for me it's fairly clear which you should choose. There's no running cost advantage in making do with the restricted performance of the least powerful model and the 163 PS variant, though rapid, is not especially cheap to run. Which is why the insignia you should probably buy is almost certainly the one I'm driving here the 2 litre CDTI 140 PS model. The stats suggest it's 0-62 mile an hour figure of 10.5 seconds to be a second slower than the 163 PS version, but in practice through the gears it feels just as responsive and offers a useful step forward in speed from the entry level diesel at the same time as still theoretically being able to achieve over 75 miles to the gallon and dip beneath the 100 grams per kilometre of CO2 barrier in class leading style. Impressive. If you do want more black pump performance than this Vauxhall standard 2 litre diesel can offer, then your dealer will oblige you by wheeling out a 195 PS by turbo version. This storms to 62 miles an hour in 8.7 seconds on the way to 142 miles an hour and can be ordered with the Super Sports chassis pack that so improves the handling of the Insignia lineup's rare but very fast flagship, the VXR Super Sports model. That machine gets a 325 PS 2.8 litre petrol V6 that's quick enough to make it the fastest car at its price point, the 62 mile an hour Sprint being demolished in 5.6 seconds on the way to 168 miles an hour. But more to the point, it gets the kind of high speed handling finesse that lower order models like this one can only dream about thanks to a hyper strut front suspension arrangement. It's the hyperstrut setup you can add to the bi-turbo diesel if you want to. That's in the Super Sports pack that also includes 20 inch wheels and Brembo brakes. And it aims, uh, hyperstrut aims to reduce torque steer, that writhing feeling that you get through the steering wheel of cruder performance cars as they struggle unsuccessfully to get their power down under heavy acceleration or out of slow corners. Very effective it is too especially in conjunction with four-wheel drive, a feature now confined to just two models in the lineup, the VXR high performance variant I've just mentioned, or a version fresh to the range, the Country Tourer Estate. This is an Insignia Sports Tourer Estate with a bit of off-road attitude, thanks to a raised ride height and the aforementioned four-wheel drive system that changes this front-wheel drive car into an all-wheel drive machine when declining grip levels automatically set the Haldex Mechanicals directing up to 40% of the engine's torque rearwards. And there's plenty of torque uh, thanks to the provision of either of the two most powerful diesel engines under the bonnet. And finally, well, I shouldn't leave this section without talking a little more about petrol power. Unlike some of its rivals, Vauxhall hasn't abandoned those with green pump preferences. On the contrary, it now offers three modern units that might just be better buys for low mileage owners. Most affordable is the 140 PS 1.4 turbo unit borrowed from the Astra and carried over from the original version of this car. Good for 62 miles an hour in 10.9 seconds en route to 127 miles an hour. More modern though are the two turbocharged SIDI, that stands for Spark Ignition Direct Injection Units, freshly developed for this revised insignia. Brisk little engines featuring inbuilt balancer shafts for extra refinement and you can order them with optional low friction six speed automatic gearboxes. There's a 170 PS 1.6 litre unit good for 62 miles an hour in 9.2 seconds on the way to 136 miles an hour and a properly rapid Astra VXR hot hatch derived 
two litre power plant, which reduces those figures to seven and a half seconds and 155 miles an hour. The Insignia was one of the very first Vauxhalls to feature design chief Mark Adams' so-called new form philosophy that's been more recently carried forward across the brand's model lineup. Now the result from the beginning was quite a handsome car with a look Vauxhall always liked to describe as sculptural artistry meeting technical precision. Nevertheless, it was time for an update, though nothing too radical. In fact, there are no sheet metal changes at all. Instead, there are detail improvements front and rear that aim to bring a wider and lower look to the hatch, saloon and sports tour estate body styles that, as before, make up the range. That's certainly the feel you get from the front end with its redesigned high gloss chrome grille and thinner logo bar cradling a prominent griffin badge and including winglets that link with the sleeker gloss black trimmed headlights. As before, the tightly pinched lines help to disguise the bulk of this car and the so-called blade design that's most noticeable in the front doors smartens up the service areas. Also familiar is the profile with its smart bowed roof line, that's what you see on the five door, dropping dramatically towards the rear with a kind of almost coupe style sweep that characterizes other stylish cars like Jaguars XF and Volvos S60. At the back, you'll spot a chrome logo bar that on all models is now mounted lower and extends into the LED light clusters. And inside, well, it feels a great deal more up to date. And it's probably here that the biggest steps forward have been made with this revised model. The phrase button clutter might have been invented for the original version of this car, which featured a dash with so many confusing little knobs and switches that many owners simply gave up trying to figure them out altogether. Uh, much of this has now been tidied up onto a sadly optional central colour 8 inch touchscreen that deals with everything from uh, navigation uh, to uh, audio selection to Bluetooth phone compatibility uh, all the way to a series of Vauxhall sourced apps. There's even a slightly cheap feeling touchpad behind the gear lever that accepts one, two or even three finger gestures for the various operating functions. Or you can press a button on the steering wheel here to activate the whole thing by voice control. Now, I'd have to say that it's not the most immediately intuitive of systems to initially get to grips with, but if you're like me and struggle a bit with these things, you can download a smartphone handbook app, which you point at the switch in question and then get a tutorial. Now, even I can manage to do that. More high tech can be viewed through the redesigned three spoke leather trimmed steering wheel, where you'll find an instrument cluster with another eight inch high resolution display. This one, also optional and framed by conventional analog gauges uh, either side is primarily there to show a virtual speedometer but can also be configured to display all sorts of information such as smartphone or audio use, uh, trip computer readouts or even navigation directions. Otherwise owners of the previous model should feel right at home. It's as easy to get comfortable as it was before, thanks to a wide range of seat and wheel adjustment. As for cabin quality, well, the materials and plastics used feel uh, slightly nicer, enough to keep lower order models competitive in this respect with more modern rivals. Go for an expensive variant though, and you might feel the whole ambience could be a little more luxurious. And back seat space. Well, it's easier to get to it if you've a sports tour estate body style like this one. The sloping rear roof line of the five door hatch version means that on that car you've to dip your head a little getting in. No such problems here. That five door model's tapering profile has also resulted in the adoption of a lower seat cushion across the range so as to preserve sufficient headroom. If you're really tall, you might find once inside that even this isn't enough to keep your head from 
brushing the ceiling, but ordinary folk should find that space here is reasonable and comfort levels quite acceptable, at least for the outer two occupants. Unfortunately, as with most cars in this class, the middle occupant will be less comfortable, perched on a harder, narrower seat centre section with legs astride this prominent central transmission tunnel. Out back, luggage capacity remains class competitive. Here, as you can see, I've got the Sports Tourer Estate, which offers a 540-litre boot, extendable to 1,530 litres if you push forward the rear bench. And there's a useful, if rather shallow, underfloor compartment. Most British buyers, of course, will be going for the five-door hatchback model, this body style now relatively rare in this segment, Ford's Mondeo being the only other directly comparable car to offer it. Insignia owners going for this variant get a wide, long, though not particularly deep, 530 litre boot, extendable to 1,470 litres with the rear bench down, though the seats unfortunately don't fold quite flat. If you must have the saloon version, then the respective cargo bay figures are 500 litres and 1,015 litres. In theory, Insignia pricing covers a very wide span, anywhere between 17 and 33,000 pounds. In practice, almost all Insignia sales are concentrated in the 17 to 22,000 pound bracket, with most of those going to business buyers who usually want one of the two litre CDTI diesel variants. Pay much more than that for this car takes it into the BMW 3 Series dominated compact executive saloon bracket, where mainstream makers usually struggle. Talking of saloons, there's a four-door Insignia saloon body style as a no-cost option to the more familiar five-door hatch, but it comes with a much smaller range of trim and engine choices. Here though, I've chosen the Sports Tourer Estate body style, which is offered at a premium of around £1,500 over an equivalent hatch. Unlike the mainstream models of the other body shapes, this one can be had with four-wheel drive, but to get it, you have to stretch up to a top-of-the-range country tourer version, priced in the 25 to 30,000 pound bracket, and aiming to snare RAV4 and Freelander folk who'd normally be looking at a compact SUV. The other key variant worthy of mention is the flagship VXR Super Sports model, which has a potentially thirsty petrol V6, but offers more performance for a £30,000 budget than you'll get almost anywhere else. And the value proposition? Well, it's strong, but then it had to be, given the way that pricing of its arch rival, Ford's Mondeo, has been cut in recent years. Vauxhall reckons it's cut an average of around £1,500 off the list price of each insignia, enough to keep this improved car competitive against the Ford and make it look very good value indeed against other competitors in the medium range marketplace. If you want something else in this segment, uh, and the seven other comparable mainstream options are Peugeot's 508, Volkswagen's Passat, Skoda's Superb, Toyota's Avensis, uh, Hyundai's i40, Kia's Optima and the Mazda 6, then list pricing suggests that in many cases you're going to have to find two to three thousand pounds more for it. And that's before you consider dealer discounting, an area where Vauxhall franchises can compete with and beat the best of them. Bear in mind too that the seven rivals I've just mentioned only come in either saloon or estate form. The Mondeo is the only direct competitor also offered as a five-door hatch. If, having considered all of this, you conclude that it is an insignia that you want, or more likely an insignia that you need, then whichever variant you select, saloon, hatch, or sports tour estate, uh, two-litre CDTI diesel, or 1.4, 1.6, or two-litre petrol, or even the VXR petrol V6, you're going to want the deal to be sugared with a decent level of standard equipment. By and large, you shouldn't be disappointed. It's a pity that on base models, you have to pay extra for the eight inch high resolution infotainment and instrument cluster screens that really bring the look and feel of the cabin up to date. Beyond that though, all the key features seem to be present and correct. So all models get LED daytime running lights, auto headlamps, uh, smart alloy wheels of at least 16 inch in size, Bluetooth phone compatibility, electronic climate control, a driver's seat with powered height and lumbar adjustment, a trip computer, 
cruise control and a decent quality stereo system with a DAB digital radio plus USB and aux sync compatibility, controllable from the leather covered steering wheel. Further up the range, most business users will want to consider a model with satellite navigation and they should also tick the box for the 230 volt floor console mounted power outlet that uh, facilitates the uh, operation of computers or other electronic devices. Keen drivers, meanwhile, will want to look at an optional FlexRide adaptive damping setup that enables you to set the response and ride of the car up to suit the road that you're on and the mood that you're in. I'd say you'll certainly need the softer Tour setting this system offers if you choose the optional 20 inch alloy wheels. Other options worth looking at if you've extra in your budget include extremely comfortable orthopedically designed ergonomic sports seats that can be specified heated or ventilated and with leather trim. Um, there's a bike rack that can take up to three cycles and a state-of-the-art Bose sound system with nine speakers, a subwoofer, uh, four broadband loudspeakers, tweeters and a digital sound processor. As for safety, well, there's the usual standard stuff, twin front side and curtain airbags, plus the usual electronic assistance for brakes, traction and stability control to hopefully ensure that you'll never need to use them. It's enough to merit a five-star Euro NCAP safety rating. But of course, you can go a lot further than that if you're prepared to fund a few options. Parking knots can be avoided with a rear view camera, a rear cross traffic alert system that warns you of approaching traffic when you're reversing, and an advanced park assist setup, which will help you identify a space, then automatically steer you into it. There's also tire pressure monitoring and an adaptive forward lighting plus setup that will automatically adapt your headlights to suit the road that you're on and the conditions that you're in at night. Those headlamps can also be specified to dip themselves in the face of oncoming traffic thanks to a forward facing camera uh, mounted up here that can also read speed limit signs as you pass and display them on the dash. Even if you miss that, there's a speed limiter function to help preserve your license in urban areas. If, on the other hand, you do a lot of highway driving, you might want to consider the lane departure warning setup that stops dozy drivers from veering out of their lanes. Or the side blind zone alert system, which stops you from dangerously pulling out to overtake when there's a car in your blind spot and the lane change alert package that warns you of traffic rapidly approaching from the rear in a parallel lane. Finally, the really clever stuff. Adaptive cruise control uses a radar to automatically keep you a safe distance to the car in front on the highway and can even bring the car to a stop and start it off again if you come across a tailback. That's for highway use, of course, but this system will help in urban motoring too, including, as it does, a forward collision alert system that constantly scans the road ahead for potential collision hazards. If one is detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond or aren't able to, the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Around 85% of Insignia buyers go for a diesel, and you can see why. Both 120 and 140 PS versions of the 2.0-litre CDTI EcoFlex model return 76.3 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and put out just 98 grams per kilometre of CO2, returns that at launch were comfortably class-leading. This gives this car an astonishing potential 1,175 mile range from its 70 litre fuel tank, which means that the average UK driver covering around 8,200 miles a year would only have to fill up with diesel seven times every 12 months. Or to put it another way, an Insignia EcoFlex driver could travel from London to Budapest on one tank of fuel. Bear in mind though, that if you want the extra punch of the 163 bhp version of this engine, those returns will fall considerably to 65.7 miles to the gallon and 114 grams per kilometre. Along with efficient electronic power steering, all of these variants get the full suite of EcoFlex features to help achieve these figures. Things like uh, a lowered chassis, low rolling resistance tyres, adapted final drive ratios, 
automatic front grille shutters and a stop start system that cuts the engine when you don't need it, stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. Plus the body shell's more aerodynamic and this along with better underbody panelling has lowered this insignia's drag coefficient to just 0.25 cd for the hatch and saloon models and to 0.28 cd for this sports tour estate. As a result of all this, it's really not too hard to find yourself averaging well over 50 miles to the gallon on a regular basis, an impressive return for a car of this size. Something even possible on the flagship 195 PS 2 litre CDTI by Turbo model, which is impressive given its 142 mile an hour performance potential. The official stats for this variant are 60.1 miles to the gallon and 125 grams per kilometre. These kinds of figures can translate into big savings and a much better deal for company car drivers who are otherwise thinking of conventional segment choices like Ford's Mondeo and Volkswagen's Passat. Let me give you an example. An Insignia 2 litre CDTI EcoFlex 140 costs around £2,000 less than a comparable Volkswagen Passat 1.6 TDI Blue Motion technology. Yet, it'll take you 11 miles further on every gallon and puts out 16 grams per kilometre less of CO2, yet is nearly two seconds quicker from rest to 62 miles an hour. Most important though will be the potential benefiting kind tax savings that come with this car. Choose this insignia over a directly comparable Mondeo or Passat and Vauxhall reckons the annual savings in this regard could be well over a thousand pounds. Take all this into account alongside the affordable asking prices and you could also find that this Vauxhall's pence per mile figures outshine those of compact executive saloons like BMW 3 Series and Audi's A4. Thinking of buying a petrol powered insignia? No, I didn't think you were. But if you're a lower mileage driver, perhaps the prospect might be worthy of a thought or two. The brand's current generation of turbo petrol units all do better than you'd expect on the balance sheet. The 140 PS 1.4T manages 54.3 miles to the gallon and 123 grams per kilometre. The 170 PS 1.6 SIDI delivers 47.9 miles to the gallon and 139 grams per kilometre. And the 250 PS 2 litre SIDI returns 39.2 miles to the gallon and 169 grams per kilometre. That only leaves the flagship 325 PS VXR Super Sports model. Now you wouldn't expect a big V6 petrol turbo variant to deliver an especially frugal set of running cost returns, and this one doesn't, managing 26.6 miles to the gallon and 249 grams per kilometre. What else? Well, like other Vauxhalls, this one comes with a lifetime warranty. It's valid for the life of the car, or up to 100,000 miles, whichever comes first, though isn't transferable onto second owners, so can't benefit residual values that, as you'd expect, uh, won't quite be up to the levels you'd get with more prestigious brands. But then, of course, you're paying a lot less upfront to start with. And at least you'll save money on insurance in comparison to prestige rivals. The Insignia is grouped between 14 and 37, with most models falling in the 14 to 20 bracket. By almost any measure you care to name, this Insignia has been a successful car for Vauxhall. Sales have been crushingly superior to those of its Ford Mondeo arch rival, continuing to increase at a time when those of most other medium range sector models are struggling. Now the reasons why have to do with sharp pricing, smart styling and low running costs, the attributes that business buyers value most and the things that remain most attractive about this much improved first generation model. This car isn't completely new, but it feels that way behind the wheel, thanks to all the fresh cabin infotainment and the higher quality feel. Those that are tempted by the shinier prospects of new arrivals will, Vauxhall hopes, be brought back into the insignia fold by class leading running costs. It wasn't long ago that it would have been simply inconceivable for a car of this kind to average over 75 miles to the gallon and put out less than 100 grams per kilometre of CO2. But that's exactly what the two most popular diesel versions of this model can now achieve. 
This car doesn't have to be economy focused of course. You could tackle a mountain trail in the country tourer version or take on the Nürburgring in the tarmac burning VXR variant. But it's really built to satisfy typical families and temperate middle management folk. People who'll appreciate the comfortable ride, the thoughtful functionality and the lifetime warranty. It's the kind of thing you'd expect from a brand that's been building four-seater family cars since 1903. Experience that really shows.